After the death of Chinggis Khan, Mongolian expansion continued across Asia. In the 1230s, as the conquests of northern China and Iran were largely completed, his son Ergodai Han sent a great host to overrun the west. Commanded by Batu, a grandson of Chinggis and a mighty general Subede, they subjugated all in their path, culminating in 1241 when they struck into the kingdoms of Hungary and Poland. Though their withdrawal in 1242 is popularly presented as permanent, this was hardly the end of Mongol interactions with Europe. For most of the late 13th century, Mongol attacks on Eastern Europe were led by one man, Nogai, a great-great-grandson of Chinggis Khan and famed as an almighty kingmaker within the Golden Horde. The following series will focus on the life of Nogai, offering a re-evaluation of his long career. But before we focus on Nogai, we must establish the world he lived in and the historiography I'm dropping you into. Following Batu's leisurely withdrawal from Hungary in the spring of 1242, he set up his camp on the Volga steppes. Though Batu began to oversee the vast new territories, he was no independent monarch. He was merely the head of the line of Jochi, Chinggis Khan's eldest son. Batu was still a servant of the Great Khan. Up until December 1241, that had been Ergodai, Chinggis Khan's third son. But Ergodai was a devil for the drink. Following his death, there was no favorite among his sons and grandsons to succeed him. While his widow, Terugene, sought to place their son Guyuk on the throne, Batu's autonomy grew ever greater. When Guyuk was declared Khan of Khans in 1246, Batu remained obstinate. He had housed ministers like Masud Bey, who Guyuk's mother Terugene had threatened. He and Guyuk had a poor relationship since the Great Western Campaign, where Guyuk had critiqued and insulted Batu's command. Batu, despite having traveled as far east as Lake Balkhash, refused to attend Guyuk in person, citing his severe gout. Guyuk's frustration grew ever greater. On a pretense of preparations to renew the attack on the west, in early 1248 Guyuk suddenly moved in Batu's direction with an army. Whether he intended to actually attack Batu or simply assert his authority is unknown. Regardless, war was averted when Guyuk suddenly and conveniently dropped dead only weeks into his march. Some sources, such as the Franciscan friar William of Rubruck, who visited Mongolia only a few years later, were under the impression Batu had Guyuk assassinated. Regardless of his involvement, Batu acted quickly following Guyuk's demise. In contact with Sorkaktani Beki, the widow of Chinggis Khan's fourth son Tolui, they moved to fill the vacuum. While Guyuk's widow Ogul Kaimish and some of Guyuk's sons fought over who should succeed him at the Hurultai in 1250 on Batu's territory, Batu and Sorkaktani had her son Menka elected Khan of Khans, reconfirmed the next year in Mongolia. Guyuk's family was outmaneuvered, and in the following months, Guyuk's widow and many members of the lines of Ergodai and Chatai were killed on Menka's order. With his ally on the throne, Batu acted as Menka's viceroy of the West. Travelers through the Mongol Empire at this time described Batu and Menka as two masters of Asia who divided the continent between them. Batu comfortably built his capital at Sarai, oversaw the rebuilding of overland trade routes and cities, established administrative ties over the Rus, and sought to enforce Joshid hegemony over the Caucasus, Anatolia, Mazanderan, Khurazan, and Horizon, in addition to his already vast holdings. Batu's might was uncontested. So great was he that his successors remembered him as the sign Han, the good Khan. Upon his death around 1255, he was succeeded by his son, Sartak, a Christian. But Sartak was not to enjoy the throne. In unclear circumstances, Sartak suddenly died. Armenian sources accused Batu's younger brothers, Berke and Berkacher, of poisoning him. Sartak's successor, the young Ulagchi, likewise found his life mysteriously cut short. Batu's widow, Borakchen Hatun, assumed the regency only for Berke to accuse her of treason. She was soon executed, and Berke stepped into the throne sometime between 1257 and 1260, perhaps once he had learned of Merka Han's death in China in August 1259. 
Berka's reign will be dealt with in more detail in our following episodes. Famous as the first Muslim Khan of the House of Chinggis, he fought a fierce war against his cousin Hulugu over the Caucasus. It is here that Nogai first appears as Berka's commander-in-chief and likely already a fellow Muslim. Avenging his father who had been executed by Hulugu, Nogai fought valiantly alongside Berka, but ultimately the war did not go well. Losing several battles, Nogai also lost an eye to a spear or arrow. And finally, Berka himself died of illness in 1266 while moving into Georgia. Nogai and the army withdrew back to Sarai, where a successor to the childless Berka was chosen, a grandson of Batu named Merka Tamer. We can consider Merka Tamer the first Khan of a truly independent Golden Horde. While Berka had spent his reign battling relatives in Hulugu, Merka Tamer built on the foundation established by Batu to advance the Golden Horde to total separation from the Great Khan. The first of the Jochit Khans to issue coins in his own name, he strengthened their hold over the Rus principalities, provided tax exemptions to the Rus church, encouraged trade and commercial activities, and came to a ceasefire with Hulugu's successor, Abaka Ilhan. He continued to foster the alliance with the Mamluks and reasserted the Horde's control in border regions. And on his order, raids into Eastern Europe were started. It was a part of Mankatamer's shoring up of his borders that he sent his cousin Nogai to what is now Eastern Romania. Nogai spent the rest of the 13th century based in this region, where I believe he acted as a Tama commander. Essentially a garrison to both defend and expand the empire's borders by raiding, threatening, and generally disrupting nearby states. And this is just what Nogai did. From here, he married a Byzantine princess, placed Tsars on the Bulgarian throne, and led invasions into Hungary and Poland. From this perch, Nogai had his interactions and conflicts with the Khans of the Golden Horde. According to most of the scholarship on Nogai, following the death of Merka Khan in 1280 or so, Nogai became the primary power broker of the Golden Horde, appointing and deposing Khans as it suited him. The depiction will go as follows. First, Nogai appoints Merka Tamer's weaker brother, Teodor Menke, then orders Teodor Menke's replacement with the combative Tolobuka. Once the relationship between Nogai and Tolobuka grew sour due to losses incurred in Hungary and Poland, Nogai has Tolobuka overthrown in 1291 by his final protege, a son of Menke Tamer named Tokta. It was in the reign of Tokta that Nogai developed his greatest pretensions overpowering and pushing around the young Han for his first years until the frustrated Tokta pushed back. Aghast that this upstart would dare stand up to him, Nogai declared his independence, making himself a Khan. Their short war culminated in Nogai's defeat and death by 1300. The problem is, this is not what is in the primary sources. This image is popular consistently portrayed and almost totally removed from Nogai's actual role in the surviving primary materials. I too was under the impression that Nogai was the almighty kingmaker, or rather, conmaker, until I began to notice this discrepancy in winter 2019 while researching this video for kings and generals. I was reviewing events from Nogai's life in one of the most important sources on the Mongol Empire, the Jami al-Tavarik of Rashid al-Din. There, expecting to find Nogai replacing Teodomunka, I was shocked to find Nogai uninvolved with the conspiracy, which was actually led by Teodomunka's nephew, Tolobuka, and a group of his own allies, rather than a puppet of Nogai. In Rashid's account, Tolobuka rules the Golden Horde through a four-way princely junta, and appears, throughout his reign, quite antagonistic to Nogai. When Tolobuka was deposed in 1291, Nogai did so in alliance with the Prince Tokta. The discrepancy immediately caught my attention, and I investigated further. It became the topic for my master's thesis, entitled The Role of Nogai in Eastern Europe in the Late 13th Century Golden Horde, a reassessment. There, I ignored the popular depiction in the secondary scholarship and the expectation of Nogai acting as a con maker to focus exclusively on the primary sources and what they said of him. In addition, offering an explanation to the origins of the conmaker image and then reassessing Nogai's life and career. I found that, 
Contrary to the common depiction, all the primary sources agree that Nogai was involved only in a single overthrow of a Khan, in cooperation with Tokta, overthrowing Tolabu Khan in 1291. The primary sources simply do not have Nogai involved in the accession or removal of any other Khan. A word should be given to these primary sources before we proceed. As essentially no sources or chronicles survive from the Golden Horde, if they ever existed, we are reliant on foreign authors for reconstructing the Horde's political history. Luckily, we are well serviced. Our most detailed accounts come from the early 14th century. The first is the already mentioned chronicle of Rashid al-Din, the great historian and vizier of the Ilhanite. The other most important source is the Zubdat al-Fikra of Baibars al-Mansuri one of the top figures of the Mamluk Sultanate. Both Rashid al-Din and Baibars al-Mansuri wrote at the same time just after Nogai's death, but from different states and independent of each other. The fact that their two works, written from two states with very different opinions of the Golden Horde, provide counts largely in agreement is significant. Less information, but still of importance, comes from the chronicles of the Rus principalities and the historia of the Byzantine author Pai Marys. Supporting information can be gleaned from some European letters, chronicles, and other accounts, which include letters of Franciscan friars in Crimea, and even the great travel book of a certain Marco Polo. The final pages of Polo's description of the world are dedicated to Nogai and the Golden Horde. And here, even in Polo's slightly garbled account, Nogai still only assists another prince in removing Tolobuka. In this, all of these sources agree. It is only in the removal of Tola Khan in 1291 that the primary sources unanimously give Nogai a role. The primary sources, be they from the Ilhanite, Mamluk Sultanate, Byzantine Empire, Rus Principalities, or a prison cell holding two Italians, simply do not have Nogai in the role so often ascribed to him by modern writers. Neither are these the only sources claims that have built up around Nogai. We will address more of these as our series goes along, relating to Nogai's ancestry and power within and without the Golden Horde, as well as the matter of his supposed independence. But if these claims have no basis in 13th or 14th century sources, where do they come from? There appear to be a few factors working together. For instance, it is popular to place the Golden Horde's history into a series of strong cons punctuated by con makers. In the late 14th and early 15th century, the Golden Horde found itself dominated by real Khan makers who, unlike Nogai, succeeded in reducing the Khans to figureheads and removing them. These were Mamai in the 1360s until 1380 and Erigu at the start of the 1400s. Unlike Nogai, both Mamai and Erigu were not Chinggisids and could never hold direct power in their own right. Further confusion comes from the fact that Erigu's sons were the founders of the Nogai Horde, a Golden Horde successor state north of the Caspian Sea, which, despite its name, bears no connection to the 13th century Nogai. Nogai is commonly seen as a forerunner to Mamai and Edegu, and the assumption becomes that he must have, like them, been a kingmaker. Because if he wasn't, then surely he would have claimed the title of Khan of the Golden Horde for himself. Such is the view, more or less, of Nikolai Vysolovsky, who wrote the first and most detailed biography of Nogai, posthumously released in 1922. Wieselowski's work argues that Nogai, due to uncertain heritage, could not claim the title of Khan and therefore had to become a Khan maker, reducing the reigning Khans to puppets, similar in fashion to Edegu and Tamer. Though Wieselowski's monograph is outdated and, as I argue, misinterprets some of the relevant sources, it remains perhaps the single most commonly cited source for Nogai's life. Some of the most well-known and recent works on the Golden Horde have and still rely on Wieselowski's depiction of Nogai. In order to fit into the conmaker model with Mamai and Edegu, the fact that Nogai did take part in overthrowing a Khan in 1291 becomes overemphasized and every other event of his life has been forced into this mold and interpreted as a man always battling the Khans. I suggest most discussions of Nogai in this period in the Golden Horde's history have simply recited secondary literature again and again without 
revisiting the primary sources. With each succeeding generation of scholarship, Nogai's role in the Golden Horde has become more and more exaggerated. While 19th century historians portrayed him as highly influential, 20th and 21st century writers made him into the dominant power of the Golden Horde, controlling the cons, the military, its diplomacy, its foreign policy. Now, this is not a knock on any of these scholars. Many of those who have used the conmaker image, such as Istvan Vissari or Peter Jackson, are some of the finest scholars on the Mongols you can find. It has just been so often repeated that most have simply taken it for granted, or assume it appears in another source that they haven't read. But I've gone through these sources. While a minority such as Alexander Uzalach have rightfully pointed out Nogai did not replace Khans, none have sought to revisit his entire career without the baggage of the conmaker image. But I have. And in the following episodes, I will demonstrate to you the new version of Nogai's life. As the Golden Horde's history in the late 13th century has been defined by the image of Nogai as the ultimate power, what you will see is also a reinterpretation of the late 13th century Golden Horde and perhaps a hint for the roots of future research. You might not agree with what I present in this series, that is fine. You may tell me to check out a book where some historian makes a certain argument about Nogai, that's totally cool. But I've read through all of these, so you better be ready for a thorough scholarly discussion, champ, because that's what you're going to get. Welcome to the reign of Nogai.